Hello, everyone. Welcome to Coffee with Kalefi. We'll go ahead and get started right at the top of the hour here. So today we are going to be talking about a project profile. So this is going to be a 90 minute conversation about a specific job site. Our host is John Siegenthaler. I'll get to his bio in a second here. We'll go through a couple housekeeping slides and then I'll turn it over to John. Okay, if you're having audio issues, the best bet is to just log out and log back in. If you want a copy of the presentation, you can hit yes in the post webinar survey and we'll send that to you. And then if you have to log out a little early or want to send this to somebody else, we'll have it up on YouTube for future viewing as well. Certificate of attendance. So this is a, a 90 minutes. So the PDH is a little bit higher. If this works in your jurisdiction, we're happy to send that to you after the, the webinar. So um, look for that at the end. Hydronics 33 is out. So this is online now. You can see this as a PDF. We are going to have it in the mail in the next week or so. So if you signed up uh, as a subscriber to get a hard copy of this, look for this in the next couple of weeks. And then also we have a cool interactive edition that is up now as well. So this is kind of like a long scroll, like e-magazine, e-book version that's searchable and you can go through all the different versions of hydronics as well as an alternative to just a static pdf and with that i'll mention that next month we're going to have a guest christoph lore with iapmo he's going to talk about the 10 things about dhw return design so this will be an interesting conversation about the standards and policies and even professional certifications related to DHW research. There is a lot of stuff that is changing in this world. So Christoph's gonna walk us through what to look for in the future as it relates to all of those different things and how they overlap, which is hard to, to decipher sometimes. And with that, I'm gonna bring John Siegenthaler on to do the presentation today. So. Welcome, John. He is the author of Modern Hydronic Heating and Cooling. We got some pre-submitted questions about hydronic cooling that we'll talk about as we go through the presentation. And with that, I will turn it over to John. Well, thanks, Max, and uh, good afternoon or good morning, whatever the case. I'm glad uh, that you've joined. Uh, as Max was saying, today's program is about a project that I've been involved with. Uh, it was a reconstruction of a parsonage at our church. And I wanna talk about the project briefly, I'll show you the, the structure and so forth, because the structure and the heating system do intertwine. So there are details uh, in the structure that lend themselves to how we could do the mechanical system. But then we'll focus primarily on the system itself. And the title here, checking all the boxes, what this system provides is space heating, cooling, domestic hot water and heat recovery ventilation. And I'm presenting it as an example of a system that uh, covers the entire need, the HVAC need of this particular house. And especially as heat pumps become more prominent in the hydronics market, this opens up opportunities for contractors that traditionally have handled the heating side of HVAC but not as much the cooling side or the ventilation side. So uh, it shows you how to extend the system out to cover all these different bases. So <clears throat> again, we're gonna talk about the project a little bit, <clears throat> and then we'll get into the overall system. We'll take the system apart. We'll look at how it operates in heating, how it operates in cooling, how the ventilation system works. We'll talk a little bit about the controls that are actually very simple in this system. And then I'll share a couple of lessons learned uh, in the project. So the starting point was a double wide mobile home. It was installed when the, uh, the church was actually formed in 1976. And this structure was put in place in 1978. It is in Prospect, New York, uh, roughly about an hour east of Syracuse. So it is in upstate uh, New York climate. It's a fairly severe winter climate. And uh, at the time, these mobile homes were pretty much designed in a way that uh, they did not have to conform to New York State building code. They conformed to a HUD standard. And as such, some of the quality of the materials 
uh, it's adequate, but not necessarily long lasting. So as this building aged, it, it received new windows. It got a new roof and you can see a fairly shallow pitch on the roof uh, and with shingles uh, at that pitch, they, they don't last very long. Uh, there was actually a flood in this building when some water piping burst and nobody was around. So it's got a new flooring system in it. And the kitchen cabinets basically were worn out and replaced. Uh, in 2012, roughly a decade ago, there was an addition here, a 24 by 24 foot addition added to it. The mobile home itself is 24 by 48. And as is typical, uh, there's a lot of volunteer labor on this project over the years. Uh, very well-intentioned people, but in some cases, people that weren't professionals at, at what they were doing. And, uh, you know, the, the quality of some of the workmanship in there was, uh, it wasn't top shelf. So after 45 years, uh, this building was in fairly dire straits. Um, there were leaks, uh, there was some, some mold developing, uh, the HVAC system was poor. It was basically window shaker, air conditioners, and a uh, oil-fired uh, forced air furnace. A uh, fairly large family in there, so it was crowded. And uh, there were just several factors that said, you know, maybe this is the time to deal with this project rather than patch it. Maybe it's time to, uh, to build something new. And one of the things that we were very fortunate, uh, this site has very well drained sandy soil. And because of that, there was very little pressure against the foundation. You can see in the lower right over here, the foundation was actually in excellent shape. It was well built when the, the mobile home was placed on it. And there was really no need to tear down that foundation based on loss of structure or anything like that. So moving forward, uh, the new building was designed to fit the existing foundation. And this is what it looks like. These are the elevation drawings of the building. Uh, it is a single story with attic trusses. So you'll, you'll see how that works. Uh, there is a full basement underneath it. It's nothing exotic. Uh, it's basically vinyl siding, asphalt shingle roofs. Um, double hung vinyl windows, although they're low E and argon fill. Uh, it does use spray foam insulation throughout and that produces uh, not only a very thermal envelope, uh, design heat loss on this building was around 12, 12 or 13 BTUs per square foot per hour at, at design condition. But the spray foam also adds considerable structure. It really siphons up the building. Um, so that's what the building looks like. And so our first process here was to take down the existing mobile home. And uh, I was involved as well as several other people uh, with demolition. And it was, uh, it was interesting. We were sawing through floors that because of the reconstruction and so forth over, over the years, some of those floors were almost three inches thick. So we actually tore the carbide tips right off some of the saw blades, trying to uh, saw the floor deck up into in pieces. And then we used the chains and an excavator to pull those out of there. We had to be careful because we had to preserve the foundation. And down here in the, in the middle, you can see that's uh, what the foundation looked like. Those uh, wood girders that go across, uh, those were removed. Though those were actually needed to set the steel frame of the mobile home on. So those are removed, but we, we had to do this in a way that didn't damage the, the blocks. And, and a block foundation like this is not as strong as a poured concrete wall. You, you have to be relatively careful, but uh, things did work out well. Uh, we took out some of the old windows. You see some of these old steel frame, single glass windows. Um, we took those out and uh, replaced those with blocks. Uh, we did preserve the floor deck in the addition. You see this big, brown tarp over it. So that was taking place in uh, roughly about a year ago in August and September of 2022. And we ended up filling up uh, five 30-yard dumpsters with the materials. We did try to salvage, but we could, but particle board flooring, two by three studs, two by two roof trusses, um, a lot of plastic moldings and so forth, really not much 
of value as far as what could we reuse in the um, in the new construction. So um, once we got this down to the foundation, we, we did add a couple small foundation extensions. You can see one up here at the top. This is an entry vestibule. It's, it's only an eight by 12 area. Uh, you can see there's uh, two inches of extruded polystyrene under, under the tubing and also on the edge for edge insulation. And this tubing is a half inch PEX aluminum PEX. It is six inches on center and that's going to get a, a four inch slab and eventually that would be covered with a ceramic tile. And there was one other small uh, foundation extension that was added, but um, we used a system that, that I've drawn several house plans with uh, 24 inch on center inline framing. And if you're not familiar with that, that's 24 inches from the center of this stud to the center of the next stud. And the word inline means that the floor joists, the studs and the roof trusses all line up in the same plane. That's an extremely strong structure because the roof loads are transferred directly down over the studs and they come down directly over the floor joists. It's also a fast construction. So this was actually framed in, in, in basically one week. They had the plywood on the roof in one week and that's a, a crew of four working on it. Uh, they actually framed the floor deck up in a day. They framed those walls up in about two days and put the trusses on in about half a day. So it's, um, it's a fast assembly. And the other thing 24 inch on center does for you, uh, definitely less holes for plumbing, for wiring. Uh, thermally, it's better. There is less conduction directly out through the studs because there are fewer studs. So it's not a sacrifice in structure. It definitely saves costs, especially these days with the, the price of materials. So uh, that was used in construction. So it was uh, weathered in, meaning the, the windows, the roof and so forth was on. Uh, that was accomplished roughly about a month after we began construction. Uh, the windows are rated at R4. Uh, I mentioned vinyl siding. Uh, you'll see 24 inch wide overhangs all the way around that, that definitely helps in terms of keeping rain out of windows and it, it actually helps preserve some of the siding as well. And then over, uh, if you look at the center photograph here, over on the rear of the building, you'll see there's a pressure treated platform and this is the air to water heat pump that is going to supply energy, uh, heat for both space heating and domestic hot water as well as chilled fluid for cooling. Uh, it's a space pack unit. It is a variable speed compressor unit. It's up on this pressure treated foundation because this area does get a lot of snow. I'm going to make sure that that heat pump is up in the air, not only against snow, but leaves, grass clippings, bugs, and so forth. Okay, so we had that unit on the stand there. Um, actually, it was there for a few months before we actually could get it piped up because winter set it and it was just uh, it wasn't necessary to have the heat pump operating during construction so that was uh, that was basically turned on i believe it was in april of this year so real quickly this is what that foundation looked like here these blue lines um, this is that vestibule we added over on the side and this is another small extension we we needed to extend the width of the building this little offset right here was a stairwell that went down to the basement. We basically covered it with six by six treated timbers and poured the slab right over the top of it. Uh, here's the addition that was added to it. And then over here on the right, and again, you can get the PDF and you can look at this in more detail. It's a nice house. It's actually um, capable of five bedrooms and three full bathrooms in this house. Uh, becoming the vestibule, there's a dining area, a kitchen area that's open, a living room. So this is all one large open area here. Uh, there is a set of stairs uh, that goes to the attic and also a set of stairs to the basement here. Three bedrooms over here, um, two full bathrooms, a laundry area, and this nice large pantry storage area. So that was the final design worked out with the uh, you know, with the existing foundation in mind. And uh, panel radiators, uh, the, the way we approach design on this system, we, we could have done other hydronic systems in here. We could have done floor heating and so forth. 
uh, cost was a, a serious consideration, especially in the, the you know the post-COVID time. Uh, we were fighting pricing. We were buying materials well ahead of time, not only to avoid uh, inflation on the materials, but just availability of materials. Uh, I believe we waited about 12 weeks to get the, the windows. So we had to uh, get a construction trailer. We had to store materials, buy materials ahead of time. And because of cost, uh, we decided to go with panel radiators. And actually, panel radiators can work very well with heat pumps. Uh, they have to be sized for relatively low temperature. But you can see they're scattered around through the building here. And these are going to operate with thermostatic radiator valves. Uh, they were Kalefi thermostatic valves. So each one of these panel radiators is independently controlled uh, as the uh, room changes temperature that thermostatic valve simply increases or decreases or holds the flow rate constant based on uh, its setting. Uh, no wires, no batteries, no apps, very simple, very reliable. And you'll see um, we can actually run this entire distribution system, including two areas of floor heating with a circulator that when it's at full speed only draws 44 watts. So it's it's very efficient from a hydraulic distribution standpoint. Uh, here's, uh, again, some more photographs of the construction. You can see the attic truss is here. And if you're not familiar with an attic truss, you get this nice big open space. Instead of a truss that just is full of webbing, this actually becomes a, a second floor in the structure. And I'll show you the floor plan in just a minute. But it's a very efficient way to create very livable space uh, without creating, if you will, two complete stories on the house. Um, over here, you can see there was a main girder that supported the floor joists. Uh, you can see the truss is here. Uh, you can also see the spray foam insulation. That's a seven inch thick uh, spray polyurethane foam that's directly up against the roof deck. So the inner portion of the truss is all within the thermal envelope of the building which is really nice with mechanicals because uh, you know, you're know you not running ducting through unconditioned spaces. And you can see right here, the, just a, this was an earlier drawing where the ducting could be run through these trusses very easily. And then uh, the distribution of forced air for cooling and for ventilation all comes through six inch runouts that go to ceiling diffuser. So getting that uh, air supply system in there, that duct system was, was quite easy. We did use another technique that some of you may not be familiar with. It's called a shallow frost protected foundation. Uh, the, the footings in this case are only down about 24 inches below the final grade. And the way that is protected against frost is with styrofoam insulation, uh, two inches, uh, uh, I'm sorry, inch and a half thick material that goes out anywhere from two to three feet horizontally from the footing. What that does is it creates a thermal break for frost. And quite honestly, in a, in a sandy soil like this, frost generally is not a consideration. But if you had clay in the soil, uh, this would provide a break between where the soil can freeze. And of course, you don't want the soil to freeze under the footings. Um, you can see the stairs over here. Again, fairly simple, just uh, a U-shaped stair assembly checking headroom and so forth. I like to do these kind of drawings just to make sure we've got you know proper headroom, proper clearances and so forth. So that's what the, the cross section looks like. Here's what we call the finished attic. Uh, we could call it a second floor, uh, but we call these finished attic spaces one and two because our code enforcement official said, if you call them bedrooms, you're gonna have to increase the size of your um, septic system. So they could be anything. Uh, they could be an office, they could be a play area, they could be a hobby area. Uh, right now, they are being used as bedrooms. So basically, when you come up off the stairs, you can go either way into a fairly large space here. It's roughly 16 by 21 on both sides. We did add a couple closets and there is uh, sufficient space up here for a small, but a full bathroom, a shower, toilet, and a, and a corner vanity. And we also had a space left where we could put the air handler. And again, all these spaces are within the thermal envelope of the building. 
And we just have a, uh, it's actually a small little shelf unit that's on casters and it slides right out if you need to get in there to service the air handler or the heat recovery ventilator that's located in that space as well. So it's fairly easy to get access to it. Um, so, so much for the structure. Now, the, uh, the heating load, uh, we were aiming for an efficient building. We wanted to keep utility costs down. Uh, design heating load is about 13 and a half BTUs per hour per square foot. It, again, at design conditions, which is about minus five Fahrenheit for uh, this particular client. Um, we did invest, and in I use that word because uh, the spray foam for this building was about $35,000. It was the highest single cost item in the entire structure, but it's a long-term investment and it is uh, a good, uh, both from an air sealing standpoint, from a structural standpoint, and, and very good from a uh, insulation standpoint. So we had R49 in the roof, R24 walls, and R23 in the floor deck over the basement. The existing basement was going to be treated as unconditioned space. Uh, we didn't want to uh, insulate the, the foundation walls. Uh, we made a decision we're going to insulate the floor deck. And in our code, we're if you do that, you, you do need to insulate your piping if it's going through an unconditioned basement. Um, over here on the lower left, this looks a little ugly, but what that is, that spray foam up against the rim joist. And you can see that spray foam actually comes down and it goes over the top of the foundation blocks. Uh, air leakage in, in wood frame houses, uh, one of the areas of high air leakage is where the sill sits on the foundation. Uh, foundations are not perfectly flat. Uh, there are gasketing material, sill sealers that you put down, but over time, wood shrinkage or just irregularities in the top of the foundation, you will have uh, air infiltration potential. So with the spray foam, we went around, we sprayed um, all these rim joists. Uh, the two white tubes you see, these are just two half inch PEX aluminum PEX tubes that go up through the floor, they go up into a, a, a Kalefi isolation valve, and that valve screws directly into the bottom connections on the panel radiators. So again, uh, we made every effort within the reason. Uh, this is not a passive house level of insulation, but it is, it is a, I would certainly consider it a very efficient structure uh, based on its size and what its load is. Uh, design load was, if I remember right, about 34, 35,000 BTUs per hour. Uh, all the warm water piping for hydronics as well as uh, uh, hot water, domestic hot water recirculation system, it was all insulated with half inch elastomeric foam and all the ducting was sealed and it was, uh, it was also insulated to prevent condensation. So again, you can see the details here with the framing, you can see a nice more or less continuous insulation over much of that framing. And uh, uh, the other thing that we've noticed with spray foam, it's a very, uh, acoustically, it's a very quiet house. Uh, if a, a dump truck is going by outside making a lot of noise, you, you really don't hear it with this. This uh, foam seems to act as a, an acoustic deadening system. So it, it produ produces a nice, well insulated structural shell for the building. So that's the building. Now let's talk about the mechanical system. And again, I, I like to show the overall system and then disassemble it into kind of sub assembly. So uh, I've talked a little bit about the, the uh, heat pump. This is a, it's a four ton space pack air to water heat pump. It does have an inverter compressor if you want to check it out. It's what they call the I. LAHP and the I stands for inverter. Uh, that's a variable speed compressor, and LAHP is low ambient heat pump. This is actually rated to operate as low as minus 22 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, before you get too excited about that, its performance at that very extremely low temperature is not very good. And really, no heat pump at, at this point in time is going to give you high COPs or high heating capacity at, at those extremely low temperatures. Um, it would probably have a COP in a range of 1.2, 1.3 under those conditions. But keep in mind, those conditions are, even in this location, are very, very rare. And when they do occur, they're very short duration. 
Um, the heat pump basically sends a mixture of propylene glycol. It's a 30% solution of propylene glycol and water. It comes in and it goes to a Calefi diverter valve. And this valve either directs, in the heating mode, it directs it up into this buffer tank. Uh, the buffer tank actually does two things. It serves as a buffer for the space heating distribution system. And you'll see these zigzags inside the tank. This is a Turbomax tank. It has lots of copper tubing in it. And domestic water, as it's drawn from a fixture, uh, pulls cold water in. They go up through these coils and they absorb heat. And quite honestly, we're probably getting 85 to 90% of the total temperature rise of the domestic water uh, from absorbing heat in that buffer tank. So it's, it's a nice dual purpose tank. And because we had lots of these panel radiators and a, and a couple small floor heating areas, there's actually 12 zones in this. So, you know, we would call that a micro loading situation. And uh, the heat pump, even though it does have a variable speed compressor, cannot modulate down to the point where it would be an equal output with, let's say, just one panel radiator drawing heat from it. So the buffer tank is in there to prevent that short cycling. Uh, the entire flow to the distribution system is a Taco 0018E. Uh, it's a variable speed pump. It's running on proportional differential pressure control. And at full output, it's drawing about 44 watts. Uh, that actually comes with a Bluetooth um, output, and you can download the app. And we've seen pumps typically running in the mid-20s to maybe 30 watts depending on how many of those panel radiators are open. Um, cooling is done through a air handler, a single air handler. Uh, it's a single zone cooling system. Um, that B&D air handler had a nice large coil in it. Uh, we're running the cooling at about 50 degree average temperature. And again, the diverter valve in cooling mode simply directs the flow down through that coil. We do not cool down the buffer tank in cooling mode. And the nice thing about that is in the summer, the system can be operating in cooling. And if the tank needs heat, the, the heat pump can simply switch over to heating mode and the diverter valve would redirect the heating output into the buffer tank. The way it is set up right now is uh, cooling actually takes priority over that. And I'll, I'll explain it in just a minute. Um, so when you're doing, uh, if you're maintaining a buffer tank uh, for preheating domestic hot water and you're doing cooling, obviously the heat pump can't heat and cool at the same time. So one of those has to be a priority and that's, that's easily handled with the controls. Uh, in this situation, we did make cooling the priority. And the reason we did that, there was an existing heat pump water heater. This was actually installed about three years before this project started. And it, it cut the bill about $100 a month. Uh, so this is absorbing heat, low grade or lower temperature heat from the basement, which is great in the summer. It keeps the basement cool and dry. And even in winter, the basement gets down about 45 degrees, well within the operating range of what this heat pump is. So that heat pump was the sole source. This heat pump water heater was the sole source of domestic water in the building prior to this reconstruction. So we kept it and we used it as the, the backup. Uh, basically what we're doing is we're using the main heat pump to preheat and we're drawing that into the heat pump water heater and that would reduce the load substantially. And you can see there is a, a recirculation system here. It's a three quarter inch PEX tubing. Because the bathroom fixtures are fairly well spread out in this building, uh, we decided to use a um, uh, recirculation system. And then the return is half inch PEX tubing. It's a small little Aquamotion stainless steel circulator and then a, a Calefi angle mix uh, tempering valve on the system. Um, now, jumping up to the top, we've got the panel radiators. And I'll show you some more photographs of this. We call this an extended manifold system. Uh, I've written and we've discussed home run distribution systems quite a bit over the, the years where we bring half inch tubing, typically PEX or PEX aluminum PEX from each radiator back to a manifold. 
we could have done that here, but we, because of the size of the building and where these panel radiators were located, we would have ended up boring a lot of holes in the floor joists and using a lot of half inch tubing to go from a single central manifold that was located right in the mechanical area out to all these. Mm -hmm. So instead of doing that, we ran three quarter inch copper tubing, basically from the midpoint of the house in both directions, we supplied it with one inch. And then we simply have T's that transition from three quarter copper to half inch PEX alumina PEX. And then that, that greatly reduces the amount of PEX alumina PEX that was required. And it, it really cuts down on labor in terms of boring holes through the joists and just uh, pulling all that tubing through there. Um, way over on the left end, this is how we integrated the two areas of floor heating. Uh, we designed this so that the panel radiators would operate at a temperature of around a hot average temperature around 110 degrees. So reasonably close to what those slab on grade areas needed. We did not want to get involved with mixing. Uh, we could have, but we would have had to add circulators and, and mixing devices of some sort. So we simply treated these two small slab areas as if they were, if you will, another panel radiator. We used thermostatic valves with capillary tubes. And uh, one of them just goes up to a dial. Um, and again, it's a Calefi product. It's a, a wall mounted dial where you have numbers from one to five and you would set it the same way you would set the, the valves that are on the radiator. Uh, another one that was in a slab area under a dining room, that was just controlled based on a sensor. We were just trying to warm a floor space under a wood frame floor. And we did that, we didn't want any, uh, we did not want to create a crawl space and we didn't want to have any type of moisture issues in that space. So we just trickle a little bit of heat into that slab to keep things uh, dry. We're not trying to drive heat up through the floor, we're just trying to keep that area dry. So that valve is set to a fairly low flow rate. And as I say, we're, we're trickling a bit of heat into that small slab area. But you can see overall, this is a very simple system to create. Um, so uh, we do have a couple poll questions today and uh, I'll, I'll run, uh, I'll, write, I'll read this and then Max is gonna run the poll. Have you ever designed or installed a system that combined a hydronic based heat pump with panel radiators? And as those are coming in, I'll just mention, um, yeah, I've, I've seen many times uh, hydronic heat pumps, whether they're geothermal water to water or air to water, Oftentimes we talk about combining them with radiant floor heating, which can be a really good solution, but panel radiators combined with heat pumps, my take is that's less, less used than uh, with radiant floor heating. And it looks like the poll confirms that. <laughs> yeah, I'll go ahead and, uh, and close it down and see what our final number is here. Okay, so we have 79% said no. So, and the the interesting thing is if we did the same webinar with our you know, Italian colleagues, I think it'd be the exact flip. I feel yeah. like that's a, that's a pretty traditional European thing as they're moving to a lot of heat pumps right now too. Yeah, very uh, traditional. And you know, it works. And, and one of the reasons I wanted to Put this out there as a poll question is I suspected that the use of panel rads with heat pumps is less common, but this prob this project is is literally proof it, it works very well. We we actually heated this building in February with 90 degree water with those panel radiators. So with proper sizing, the panel radiators can operate at temperatures that are very compatible with a heat pump and they give you room by room zoning. They're relatively easy to install. Um, so it's definitely a good combination from a, uh, design standpoint. Okay. Now let's focus. We're going to take the overall schematic apart here. So again, I'll just give you a quick run through. Heat pump is outside. You can see it here on the stand. Here's the, uh, a couple pieces of flexible reinforced hose. They transition down to one inch, uh, copper and that goes in through the uh, band joist of the building. Um, so that, that flow comes in, it comes to the Calefi diverter valve, either it goes to the buffer tank in heating mode or it goes to the coil 
of the air handler in cooling mode. So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, we did incorporate because that, you know, it's a closed pressurized loop. And because we're using antifreeze, we put in a, uh, a fill, a, a dual port purging valve. Uh, now the head loss on that particular heat pump is, is relatively high. So we, we did have to use a, uh, uh, I'll call it a medium sized circulator. It's not a huge commercial circulator. Uh, a Taco 2400, if you want to look that up, I think it's around 300 watts. But that was necessary when we looked at the combined head loss of the heat pump and the coil in the air handler and the piping that is between those two in the cooling mode operation. Uh, we also put in a magnetic dirt separator. We've got a micro bubble air separator in here. And then the uh, supplemental and backup heat is provided by a 9 kW electric boiler. And, and there's what that boiler looks like. It's uh, from Electro Industries. It's called a mini boiler. And that's on its own uh, circuit. I believe that's a, it's either a 40 or 50 amp uh, double pole breaker. And it's just got a little Tayco 0015. Uh, so the electric boiler is in parallel with the heat pump as far as uh, either one could send heat into the buffer tank. They can operate at the same time or they could operate completely independently. Uh, the controls that we are using are is simply a two-stage set point control. Uh, the first stage is the heat pump and the second stage is the boiler. So if the heat pump cannot produce a certain minimum temperature. Uh, roughly, we drop about three degrees below, um, and then we we uh, bring on the electric boiler for supplemental heat. Uh, I mentioned the TurboMax tank, dual purpose. It, it's buffering for 12 zones of heating, and it's providing a preheating function, uh, a significant preheating function for domestic hot water. This entire system for heating and cooling only uses three circulators. So, you know, again, I, I feel the days of seeing, you know, 40 circulators lined up on a wall, we're, we really should be past that. Uh, we, can, we can do a lot with relatively low wattage uh, with a system like this. And uh, the, the single Tayco circulator provides all the flow. Here's, um, here's what the TurboMax tank looks like. It's a 72 gallon tank. Um, Quite a few piping connections on it, but other than that, pretty simple. Here's the Kalefi diverter valve. That's the same size. This is a 24 volt power open and power close actuator. It's not a spring return actuator. You can disengage the clutch and manually move the valve around. Okay. Uh, over here, you see there's an expansion tank, and we used an Axiom uh, fluid feeder, a small one. Uh, we put the mixture of uh, antifreeze and water in that. If it needs a boost, uh, that's on its own. Um, uh, it's on its own pressure switch that can antifreeze as necessary. But really, once the system is purged out, uh, we haven't had any issues really um, to add antifreeze to it. So that's the source side of the system. The distribution system and our panel rads. Uh, we talked about the schematic here. Uh, here's a close up of. The three quarter inch copper tubing, it's running through these um, clamps that allow it to expand and contract without making noise. We did a, a two by four block just to offset one pipe versus the other. This runs right down the main girder of the house, which runs in a straight line, the complete length of the house. So it was a very simple, clean path to mount this uh, tubing. And then the transition, this is a press T, it's a three quarter by three quarter by half press T. We did have to use a small stub of half inch copper because at the time we were able to find a fitting. Uh, this would be half inch, ideally a, a, a fitting that was half inch fitting connection by half inch PEX aluminum PEX. Uh, we shopped around and we just couldn't find it. So there was a small length of half inch copper tubing that was soldered into the transition over to the half inch PEX aluminum PEX and then that was pressed into the side port of the T, okay? And again, all this piping was insulated after, as the system was completed. You can see the two areas of floor heating here. Again, that's all half inch uh, PEX aluminum PEX tubing. Uh, we sized the radiators up for 110 degree average water temperature under design load. And uh, we were able to turn the system on 
uh, using the electric boiler as the sole heat source uh, back in February. And um, as the construction was getting pretty close to wrapping up, we were maintaining a very comfortable, at least 72 degrees inside with 90 degrees supply water going through these panel rads. So I believe our load may have been a little lower than what was calculated. Uh, so we were delighted that um, the water temperature requirements are quite low. Uh, in, in fact, lower than some radiant floor temperature requirements might be. And that all speaks well to good um, heating efficiency on the heat pump, good COP on the heat pump. Okay. And uh, over here on the right, again, you can see that there, there's the little 0018 that's providing flow to the entire system. Now, cooling. Uh, again, I mentioned the diverter valve. So this, this pipe here, this one inch copper tube comes into the common port of the diverter valve. And for cooling, it would go up. And you can see this is part of the insulation system that was installed. This is, in the, in the meantime, this has all been covered with insulation. Uh, so that would take the chilled fluid up to the air handler. Uh, here's a, a photograph of the air handler over here. Uh, that air handler is basically a cube. It's two feet by two feet by two feet, nominally. So it's relatively small. Uh, it's got a nice large coil in it, which uh, is excellent for not only for heating, if you, if, if you needed it for heating, we, we didn't in this project, but it also allows us to keep that chilled fluid temperature uh, up in the range of about 50 degrees and, and easily cool and dehumidify the, uh, the air with that. Uh, we use one inch PEX tubing from the diverter valve up to that air handler. Uh, and we put six foot lengths of this um, elastomeric foam insulation on as we routed it up through the framing up to the uh, location of the air handler. Uh, here's the Tayco 2400 circulator that, that operates whenever the heat pump is operating in either heating mode or cooling mode. And um, again, that was necessary when we looked at the head loss of the heat pump, as well as the coil in the air handler and the piping in between, we needed to get a flow, um, if memory serves me, uh, at least 10 GPM. It's a nominal um, three to three and a half ton cooling load at peak. Um, over here on the left, this is a clip made by Holdright. It's it's a uh, it's a polymer clip, and you see it goes into a a, a strut channel. The nice thing about this is, and it's a little hard to see it because of the, the shadows here, but the elastomeric foam can actually push right inside of this. And literally it comes the, from the two ends, uh, the two pieces of insulation are within about an eighth of an inch of each other when they're pushed into the socket on this fitting. So you get good mechanical support. There are little ribs, uh, plastic ribs inside the clip that mechanically hold the tubing concentric with the, with the fitting there. Uh, so you don't have to worry about it hanging on the insulation and flattening out the insulation. And after the insulation has been pushed in, uh, just a, a bead of silicone caulk around the outside and, and you've got a, uh, a nice system of essentially continuous insulation, which is very important uh, because this piping is going to be carrying chilled fluid from the heat pump. And if you have gaps in insulation, uh, areas that are simply aren't insulated, uh, you're going to have condensation. So as the hydronics market moves more towards heat pumps, and as more of these heat pumps are doing chilled fluid cooling, it's very important to do that insulation correctly. It is somewhat tedious. Uh, I, I work with another fellow. We install most of the insulation. Uh, but it, it does need to be done or you'll, you can make a mess with uh, condensation. Okay, I think that covers everything on that slide. So that's the cooling side. So let's do another poll question. We've been talking about combining hydronic heating and cooling. So have you ever designed or installed a system that combined, a hydronic, that combined hydronic heating with chilled water cooling? So while we're waiting for the answers to come in there, John, I've got a question from the chat and just kind of theoretically, let's say you have the size of the panel radiators or you went with FinTube baseboard instead. What 
do you like what's the ripple effect of that what do you have to change in this system to accommodate kind of higher temperatures in a smaller surface area for those zones with panel radiators yeah that's a good question and that's going to come up a lot in retrofits where baseboard is already installed and typically sized around higher water temperatures uh the bottom line is the heat pump can still work under partial load conditions and how much of the total space heating energy on a seasonal basis comes from the heat pump, it, it'll depend on several things. It'll depend on how much baseboard there is, you know, versus what the load is. It'll depend on the heat, you know, the heat load of the, the structure and certainly the geographic location. We have done modeling on this. We we worked on a project for NYSERDA a couple of years ago. And what we're finding is that with a low ambient heat pump, size to about design load uh, we're covering in, in the range of about 85 plus percent of the total seasonal energy even with an unmodified baseboard system and the other 15 percent nominally is coming from the existing boiler so in a retrofit situation uh, my suggestion would be to evaluate the boiler does it have service life left to it and if so, to leave that in the system and treat it as the backup, as well as the supplemental heat source and integrate the heat pump in parallel with it. Um, in new construction, you know, you, you can design around the low temperature hydronic distribution system like we have in this project. And, you know, you're going to get essentially all your heat. Now, you might say, why is the electric boiler in there? It's, it's in there if the heat pump is down. The heat pump is able to cover even design load output in this building. Uh, but if that heat pump is down and there's a, a component that we're waiting for, you know, given supply chain issues today, obviously we don't want the building to be without heat. So we, we did incorporate the electric boiler for that. But to answer that question specifically, you need to do a simulation. And um, as I say, we've done some simulations for different New York state climates because the project was funded through NYSERDA and we're finding anywhere from uh, I'll say at, at lowest I believe around 80 percent of the energy even with a high temperature baseboard system was being supplied by the heat pump now you might say but heat pumps can't do 180 degree water and that's very true you don't need 180 degree water much of the year think about outdoor reset control uh, where we can back the water temperature requirement down based on how how warm it is outside. So on a uh, you know even on a warm February day in upstate New York where the air temperature might be 35 or 40 degrees, we probably only need and, and I, I'm making a, a guess at this, but probably in the range of 125, maybe 130 degree water, even in a system that at design load needs 180 degree water. So. I do foresee a, a good market developing where heat pumps like this will be uh, integrated in with existing fossil fuel boilers and with, uh, you know, legacy hydronic distribution systems that were designed around these relatively high water temperatures. Um, and I would say at a minimum in your project here, you would probably add a mixing valve for the radiant zones if you did just small yes. fin tube yeah. baseboard in the zones or something like that you know it depends on what the radiant zones are if they were slab on grade um and you have low resistance floor covering 12 inch tube spacing where you need water temperatures you know maybe 100 105 degrees and if the balance of the system was operating substantially above that maybe 20 degrees fahrenheit above that yeah i i would definitely see a mixing situation but before you go to mixing, a, a suggestion is to look at it. Can we somehow operate this distribution system at one temperature, one common supply temperature? Now that temperature will vary based on outdoor reset control, but we don't necessarily have to in, incorporate mixing into the system. Now, where you know where you may not need mixing, let's say it was. Um, an underfloor plate and tube system that needed 140 degree water, maybe even 150 degree water at design load, and you had some baseboard, you may not need to do mixing. And 
the, the objective from a design standpoint is to try to bring those temperatures reasonably close and then go to a single supply temperature if possible. Sometimes you can do it, sometimes you can't. It, it just depends on you know, what those distribution systems are, what those heat emitters are and so forth. Okay, Great. so back to the poll. Close this poll and share it here. Mm -hmm. So a little bit different, uh, closer to the middle answer here. So 56% said no. Okay. And uh, okay, 44, yes. So, um, so we're starting to see if roughly 44% are answering yes, we're starting to see somewhat of a utilization of chill water cooling. Uh, obviously it's been around in commercial buildings for decades, but it is a technique that if you're planning to be in hydronics going forward, as heat pumps become more and more dominant in the market, you have a machine that can provide chill water. Um, you don't pay any more for a heat pump to provide chill water. If, even if you're buying it primarily for space heating, they come with reversing valves. So you have they, uh, you have a chiller and it is definitely a good marketing position to offer cooling. This has always been one of the Achilles heels of, of hydronics in the past is, but what do I do about cooling? Now with heat pumps, uh, chill water cooling is, uh, is very doable and there's lots of equipment out there to put it together. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, domestic hot water system. Um, here was the existing heat pump water heater. Okay, you can see uh, up at the top here, that is actually the refrigeration system, the heat pump, if you will. And then uh, below that is the storage tank. Um, right at the beginning, we, we talked about Hydronics 33, that's just coming out. That is all about heat pump water heaters. So there's a lot of information on that in there. But because this unit was only two to three years old, we wanted to preserve it and use it as a backup for domestic hot water. Uh, it had been providing all the domestic hot water, but now with the uh, buffer tank, the TurboMax tank, we're getting a, a significant, and I'm going to say 85 to 90% of the temperature rise 20, 12 months a year. All, you know, all year long, we're maintaining that buffer tank. Um, we've played around with the controls a little. I think right now we're maintaining that buffer tank. Uh, we well, can see up at the top between 95 and 105. So average about 100 degrees, a little, little cool uh, for domestic hot water. You know, if it was to go directly to the tap. So the heat, but it definitely removes much of the load on the heat pump water heater because the water is already preheated. Uh, and both the heat pump and the electric boiler, when necessary, can be turned on to heat the uh, the buffer tank. Uh, Existing heat pump water heater supplies that final temperature lift. And again, just like uh, we wanted to incorporate the electric boiler to back up the heat pump, we wanted to make sure we have something that could provide full backup on domestic hot water if the main heat pump was down for service. Um, here's the uh, angle mix uh, valve on there. And here's the uh, small stainless steel circulator, uh, aqua motion circulator. And that goes off through a domestic water research system. The, uh, the distance from that to the farthest bathroom was about 40 feet. So without that domestic circulator running from a cold start, if you just open a hot water tap and start timing, it was probably 35 to 40 seconds to have you know, full temperature water there. With this running, it's two seconds. It's almost instantaneous when you uh, open the faucet. So uh, it was a nice feature to add and uh, uh, and we did. So that's uh, domestic water heating. And now we go to that fourth element, heat recovery ventilation. Now I've described the, the building envelope. It's a very tight envelope. We didn't, we didn't build leaks into this envelope. Uh, it's not to say that there aren't some that there isn't some air infiltration, obviously around windows and doors and so forth. But we set up a heat recovery ventilator and the way that unit operates is it basically takes outside air and in, in the winter time, this would be cold air coming in. 
it goes up through a heat exchanger core and here's a, a cutaway of that unit over here and this diamond shape right here is the the core of that heat exchanger and it's it's made out of plastic but essentially it's an air to air heat exchanger so as that cold air goes up through that core it is absorbing heat from the exhaust air that is coming from uh, there's basically three ducts from each of the three bathrooms that collect that air and they send it out through this recovery system and then heat is exchanged uh, nominally about 70 percent uh, heat exchange on these so you're you're providing fresh ventilation air it's running at about 120 or maybe 150 cfm on high speed and that air is injected directly into the return side of the air handler now the air handler can run at 1200 CFM for cooling, nominally 400 CFM per ton. Uh, we don't really need it running at 1200 CFM to distribute ventilation air, let's say in the winter time. And so we talked to the manufacturer and because these are ECM motors, they were actually uh, able to customize the motor or the controller for the motor so that when we energize one tap on that motor, we could operate at a nominal 150 CFM. And if we energize a different tap, we could take it up to 1200 CFM. So 24 seven, we're running that air handler at that low speed. And we're simply taking that fresh air and pushing it out through the same ducting system that would deliver cooling air in the summertime. Why, why install a secondary duct system just for ventilation air? Um, now, when we go into cooling mode, uh, we energize the, the different tap on the uh, blower controller, and that takes it up to 1200 CFM. The heat recovery ventilator can also switch uh, from a, a low speed mode to a high speed mode. We're switching it into high speed when we uh, basically want ventilation from bathrooms during showers. Uh, there are no other uh, ceiling fans, for example, in the bathrooms. Uh, there are wind up timer switches, very simple. And when you wind up the timer switch to 10 minutes or 15 minutes, I, I think they can go up to maybe 45 minutes. Uh, it simply kicks the uh, unit to a high speed mode and uh, provides a little more air, um, exhaust air from the bathrooms. Um, and again, all the ducting runs through conditioned space. Now, with a forced air system, obviously you, you want balance. Uh, you can't provide supply air without providing a path for a return air. We didn't really want to provide a whole secondary return air duct system. So what we did, we used a product. Uh, this is a product made by a company called Tamarack Technologies up in New Hampshire. And it's, it's a grill that you cut into the bottom of the interior doors. And in there, there is acoustical suppression and also light suppression. So air can flow through this panel, uh, through the, the core of this panel, but it does suppress sound and it does suppress light. Now, it doesn't completely block either. Well, the light part, it, it does, but um, uh, from a sound standpoint, uh, you know, it, it's not as if you've just got a big hole through the door. Uh, relatively inexpensive, uh, you take a, a saber saw and cut these into the bottom of the doors. So all the interior doors use these, and this provides a relief path so as air is injected into these rooms it can flow out if the doors are open obviously uh, there's plenty of uh, space for that air to come back to a central return grill in the hall which is literally about four feet away from the air intake on the heat recovery ventilator uh, rather than use the filter bay in the air handler we installed a, a filter grill so that it's simply easier to change the filter at that location than it is to go into the air handler to change the filter. So it works, it works good. And uh, again, uh, there's, uh, I think there's seven people in here uh, that make this their home. So there's, a f there's definitely a need for ventilation, especially with a very tight thermal envelope. So right from the beginning, it was planned to uh, provide uh, heat recovery ventilation. And, and again, it's it's something that you can integrate into your offerings along with hydronic heating, cooling, and domestic hot water. 
uh, controls. Again, you, you can go back on the PDF and study this in, in more detail, but I will summarize it. We started with a 100 amp sub panel. Basically everything on the HVAC system is fed from this sub panel. It was just easier given where we located the equipment as opposed to running separate circuits back to the main panel. And then down below here, there's a 12 by 12 box and you see a couple relay sockets in here. Uh, we used uh, triple pole, double throw relays, just uh, Dayton industrial relays, very reliable and relatively inexpensive. And that provides the switching logic that we needed here. Um, there's essentially two controls over here, a couple Techmar controls. This upper one is a two-stage set point controller. Uh, the first stage operates the heat pump. It just provides a contact closure to operate the heat pump. And stage number two is a, another contact closure that operates the electric boiler. And uh, again, you have complete flexibility where those set points and differentials are programmed. Right now, I believe we're bringing on the electric boiler if we fall about two degrees Fahrenheit below the lower set point uh, differential of the uh, first stage contact. Okay. The other controller was for cooling. And what, what can happen but would be undesirable, imagine that your heat pump has been operating in the summer. Let's say it's a hot day in July or August. Heat pump is, has just maintained your um, preheat tank with warm water. So the heat pump's been operating and heating. It's got that domestic water buffer tank up to maybe 110 degrees. And then it, if you immediately switch to cooling, you're going to have hot fluid in the piping in the heat pump. And that hot fluid is gonna go up into the coil of the air handler. And for maybe a minute or so, you're gonna get a blast of warm air coming out of the ducting. And that's you know not something you want in cooling operations. So, we simply used a little uh, set point controller. And all this does is it keeps the blower in the air handler from running until the water coming in is at least 66 degrees. So if the, the fluid had been at a higher temperature, uh, it's simply gonna pass through and the, the heat pump's gonna pull it down quickly. It's a four ton heat pump operating against maybe uh, 60 feet of one inch piping. That's not a lot of fluid. So it's gonna pull that temperature down quickly. But once that temperature drops to 66 degrees, we enable the blower to operate. And again, that's just to prevent that, um, that burst of warm air, even though it'd be short duration, it's why is the system blowing warm air is, is the comment, obviously. Um, if you look at the control schematic later on, these are just switches. This is a double pole, double throw switch. This is a double pole, um, single throw. I'm sorry, double pole, double throw switch as well. And these switches determine the mode of the system. Uh, we, we have a couple switches here, they aren't labeled yet. The upper one is the ventilation system. It's either on or it's off, whatever reason. If you wanna turn the heat recovery ventilator off, you simply move that switch to the off position. The lower switch is a center off double throw switch. So in one direction, it enables heating. In the middle position, heating and cooling are both disabled and in the other position, it enables cooling. So it's a, it's a mode selector switch. And here's a very little inexpensive, very simple bimetal thermostat that operates in cooling mode. This is a cooling only thermostat. Uh, actually, I'm gonna go up there and kind of white out what it says right here, because this thermostat, the only function of that thermostat is during cooling mode operation. And the reason I wanna, white out this text here, I don't want people to be confused. Um, you, you're not changing the system from heating to cooling. Actually, uh, there are no switches down here to do this, but the labels are still there. Um, here are those two controllers, the Tecmar 150 and the 152. You'll see some relay contacts and coils. These are used simply to create the necessary logic for the system to operate. For example, to operate the diverter valve, it's power open and power close. It's not just power open and then you remove power and a spring closes it. So we needed to coordinate with heating and cooling, you know, which, uh, which lead on the actuator is getting a 24 volt signal. Uh, the electric boiler has its own contact that turns on the circulator that's on its own dedicated circuit of 60 amp, 240 volt circuit. Uh, here's the circuitry for the uh, air handler. And also 
this particular heat pump, the way you enable this to operate, one contact turns the system on. And so we have to turn it on in both heating and cooling call. In other words, anytime we're calling this heat pump to operate as either a heating device or a cooling device, we have to give it a contact closure. So you see, here's one for heating, here's one for cooling, and they're just in parallel. The other contact here determines which mode it's in. If it's an open contact, it's in the cooling operation. If it's a closed contact, it's in heating operation. Now, not all heat pumps are going to use that same logic as far as heating and cooling. Some of them are going to have, you know, a Y, a W, an R, and so forth. So you, you do have to make sure that the controls that you're using for other devices in the system will coordinate with what is necessary on the heat pump to uh, operate it in either heating mode or cooling mode. It's not hard to do that, but I found that these relays are, are really simple uh, and they're extremely reliable. I mean, they're industrial quality relays. So it's extremely rare that they fail. And the rest of that uh, box down here is, is basically just a big junction box where all the wiring comes together. Here's a master switch to turn it on and off. Uh, here's the um, 24 volt power to operate uh, the relay coils and, and also those controls. Over here on the far right is the, uh, it's that Calefi thermostatic radiator valve that's attached to the valve that is in the upper right corner of the panel radiators. And you'll see the numbers on here, one, two, and they go up to five. We usually start these systems setting it for three, which is around 68 or 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And what we found actually is the occupants had uh, been turning them down to about two, and that's that's with 90 degree water being supplied. So uh, this system is, is operating really well with that low water temperature. Uh, here are the three timer switches that go over to the ventilator and um, operate it at high speed. So uh, there is a sequence of operation that's written. Um, I don't have it here, but I think if you just take a look at that schematic there, you'll see that it's it's, although I, there's a lot of lines there, you might say it looks complicated. It's actually a pretty simple system. Um, not, not a whole lot of um, high-end controls and uh, yet 12 independent zones of heating and a uh, single zone of cooling. Now, I mentioned a couple lessons learned here, and, and these, I'll, I'll admit on this one, I should have seen this one coming and I didn't. Uh, if you look at the diverter valve here, when the system is operating in cooling, the B port will be completely closed, okay? So the flow is coming in, this is chilled fluid coming in, and it's coming into the AB port, and it's going out the A port through the coil, and then back to the heat pump. Well, we also included a check valve right here, and that check valve was to prevent the chilled fluid from migrating along the piping here back towards the buffer tank. Remember, the buffer tank is still maintained at a, in a warm temperature in the summer. Well, what we found was kind of interesting. Uh, as the system was operating and cooling, everything was fine. When, when the cooling mode stopped, when, in other words, when the thermostat was satisfied, Within a few minutes, we started to see fluid dribbling out of the relief valve. So why is it going on? Well, it turns out that the, the fact that we have isolated that heat pump from the expansion tank, you can see the expansion tank uh, way over on the far right of the system. With this port closed and this check valve, there is no way for this portion of the circuit to communicate with the expansion tank. And what was happening is, as that chilled fluid was starting to warm up, just absorbing heat. Remember, uh, water is an incompressible fluid. It doesn't take much of a temperature rise. It was actually expanding as it warmed, and that was causing this dribbling from the relief valve. Uh, the pressure was going up, and the it's just the 30 PSI relief valve. So, uh, as I say, we should have seen that one coming and tried to make some provision uh, maybe relocated the expansion tank over here that that would have solved the problem or you know would have prevented it from occurring uh, but once we found it you know we had fluid in the system we really didn't want to start draining things and, and cutting piping we simply put another expansion tank we put it on a hose bib connection right here a small little Amtrol 15 tank and that solved the problem uh, as long as there was some space for expansion 
uh, that uh, dribbling from the relief valve stopped completely. So in hindsight, uh, would have been wiser to put the expansion tank over here and solve that. But uh, I, I pointed out only because as you look at schematics, uh, review them and see under every operating mode as fluids heat and cool and obviously expand and contract, do they have a communication path back to where the tapping of the expansion tank is uh, to make sure that you don't create this isolated portion of piping. Okay. Uh, the other thing we found, and I again, I didn't realize this, is that um, some of the valve cores that are installed in radiators uh, are different length. And you can see on the left here, when I uh, took one of the collective valves out and went to screw that onto the uh, valve on the radiator, it, it simply won't reach. The uh, valve was longer. It turns out that this is, it's a Meissen radiator and they use a Danfoss core for this valve. So this is a Danfoss core uh, and it, it simply was longer um, by design, I guess, to integrate with the Danfoss TRVs. Well, we're using a Kalefi TRV and fortunately, Kalefi came up with a great uh, solution on this uh, from the European market. It's something I'm sure they've run into. It's simply an extender. So it's a, uh, a molded polymer part here. You can see there's a small set screw that clamps this onto this valve body. And then the TRV head just screws onto the uh, threads that are right out here. So it works fine. Uh, but uh, again, the lesson learned is uh, don't assume that all those, uh, that there's complete compatibility between all the different TRVs and the, the different valve cores that might be used in, in different makes and models of radiators. Uh, two things that uh, we learned, but you know both were solvable, and I, I bring them up simply to point out uh, that you know you may have a similar situation. So uh, do a do a double check on things. So as of June, everything is up and running. Um, it's working really good in the system. And uh, again, I, I want to thank several companies that, that did assist us with this project. Uh, again, we went into this in the COVID years, in the planning stages and the execution and buying materials and so forth. Uh, we were kind of hitting the peak of supply chain issues and as well as material price issues. And um, so those companies that are listed there all helped us uh, financially with making this possible. It, uh, it would have been substantially more expensive without their assistance. So I want to recognize them all and uh, thank them all for their contribution to the project. And with that, um, Max, I'm going to turn it back to you and we'll, we'll run through some slides and then take some questions. Sure. So I'll put a couple things. I sent one in the chat. I'm going to send another one with the link to register for next month's Coffee with Kalefi with Christoph Floor. If you have any questions and want to talk to a human being at Kalefi about it, uh, you're welcome to call us. This is a direct line to our support staff as well as that email address. One of the friendly faces on the slide there will get back to you and, and help with more application specific questions. And we also have the Ask Kalefi podcast. So Greg and Dan are two of the guys that are going to answer tech support calls. And you know, Dan has for a really long time as well. He's moved into OEM. Uh, but they walk you through some of the calls that come in in a format that you can listen to in your truck on the, the way to work or something like that. So that's another good way to get information. And we love to see pictures of job sites. So if you have something that's a, a unique application of a product or something that somebody on your team did really well in a field, we love to see those and, and like and, and share and boost those posts. And with that, I think what we're gonna do is switch over to some Q&A. So there are a couple questions that, we got a lot of questions in the chat. There are a couple that I wanted to run by you. One, I know that you have mentioned with another kind of similar project using a D superheater with a heat pump as some DHW uh, mm -hmm. temperature assistance. Do you wanna kind of go through what would be different for that to be a possibility? Yeah, absolutely. Um, many geothermal heat pumps, whether they're water to air or water to water, <clears throat> 
have these superheaters, which is a secondary heat exchanger. It takes the hot gas directly from the compressor and, and uh, transfers heat from that to domestic water. Now, with an air-to-water heat pump, it's, it, there's, there's only one manufacturer that I'm aware of that does offer a desuperheater. The issue is this, um, not taking domestic water outside. If you have a um, monoblock air-to-water heat pump, the uh, desuperheater heat exchanger would have to be inside the monoblock unit, which is outside. So the risk is potentially freezing domestic water if you know it had a power outage or, or something that simply caused um, low temperatures in the outdoor unit. Now, uh, there is a company, it's a Maritime Geothermal, and they, they sell a product called the Nordic Air to Water Heat Pump. Their design approach is a little different, but it's, it's interesting. Uh, it's a split system. The outdoor unit only has a coil and a fan. That's it. The compressor, the controls, and the condenser in heating mode operation are all in the indoor unit. Because of that, they, they do offer the option of putting a D superheater. Uh, in there. So, um, you know, a D superheater is a, is a very good approach when the compressor is typically inside the building because, again, it's the hot gas directly from the compressor into the heat exchanger that we're, we're calling this D superheater. Um, so, it's not as common in the air to water simply because the compressors, especially in monoblock systems and in most split systems, the compressors are outside. So, it's not as practical. Um, that being said, uh, using that TurboMax tank with the uh, heat exchanger coils in it, uh, you're effectively getting heat from the heat pump to heat your domestic hot water. Uh, I'm not sure if there's any substantial efficiency difference there. Um, there would be in cooling mode because in cooling mode, the desuperheater is actually providing free heat to your domestic hot water. It's heat that would have to be dissipated either into a ground loop or perhaps outside. Uh, whereas um, with the air to water unit, um, you, you don't have that option. So these superheaters are more common with geothermal. Um, I think as you see more split system air to water, you may see other products that have the, comp anything that has the compressor in the indoor portion of the system potentially could be uh, built with a desuperheater in it. We've got another question about running chilled water all the way out to the panel radiators, which kind of takes the complexity up a notch from yeah, no. a control standpoint and a condensation standpoint. Yep. What would you need to do to do radiant cooling in this project? And is a panel radiator a good terminal unit for that? Uh, I would say no. Uh, you're, you're in dangerous territory. Um, panel radiators aren't designed with any kind of condensate collection system. Uh, there, are, there are console fan coils that do have condensate uh, drip pans in them, but uh, no, we are not running that chill fluid out to those panel radiators. The, the only place the chill fluid in this project goes is the coil of that b and air handler, and that does have both a primary and a secondary drain pan on it and a, a three quarter inch line to take that condensate away. Uh, so, you know, again, I know that the question of radiant cooling comes up a lot. Um, it's doable in theory. I don't see it as being very practical at this point in time in residential construction. Uh, it is much more practical in larger commercial industrial types of buildings. Uh, where you have more sophisticated controls, uh, where you can manage dew points and so forth. So um, we've opted to just use air handlers. And, and even within air handlers, there's a couple ways you can deal with chilled fluid. You can do it the way we did it in this project. A single air handler provides all the cooling, and then you duck the air to where it needs to go. The other option would be to put in multiple console type or high wall units. If you're familiar with the, the uh, I, I refer to them as cassettes, the high wall cassettes that are used with ductless mini split heat pumps. You can buy products that look identical to those cassettes. They're just set up for chilled water rather than refrigerant. 
So you can do multiple uh, air handlers or multiple console fan coils. The, the key thing is uh, you have to have a way to collect the condensate that is going to form and drain it away. And what my experience has been is the cost of doing, you know, say, three or four or five chill water console units does tend to get pricey compared to doing a single chill water air handler and ducting. Uh, the reason for that, remember, you're bringing piping supply and return, both of which have to be insulated properly for chill water. You're bringing power to it, and you have to have a condensate drain from each one of those console units. So the infrastructure that you have to put together, it does tend to get expensive and, and just time consuming in, in terms of putting it, you know, installing it. And one of the things that I like about the heating side of those panel radiators is it's just those thermostatic radiator valves. Uh, yep. That wouldn't work as a control method if you switched over to chilled water that you would need humidity sensors in each of those zones that could be isolated in, in some way to either turn that zone off if you were getting closer to the dew point um, yeah. or something you know, more sophisticated, which as you're saying, brings it for sure to a commercial controls package yeah. that is possible, but um, also the capacity is gonna go down too. So right. even if you had 60 degree chilled water going through those panel radiators, you might need to go even bigger still. And that's why radiant cooling is usually a good way to go because you have so much more surface area where just that panel radiator right. and, close and, to the floor isn't going to do a whole lot of cooling. Right. It's it's not an ideal um, setup uh, from a hardware or, you know, kind of the physics of cooling. It, it, it isn't. The other thing, Max, that's important to mention is that even when you're doing radiant cooling, remember radiant cooling only provides a portion of the sensible cooling load. It doesn't do uh, latent cooling. It doesn't do moisture removal. You're going to have to have an air handling system of some sort in the building uh, in addition to radiant cooling panels. So the ducting is going to have to be there. Now, granted, the ducting can be smaller than it would be in an all air system where you're doing forced air for both sensible and latent cooling. But you, you do have to have a means of uh, controlling humidity. Uh, radiant cooling is not going to do that by itself. So in a commercial industrial building, you almost always have a central air handling system for, for you know, code mandated ventilation standards. So it's, it's easier to modify that system or, or operate with controls that can deal with dew point control as opposed to residential projects. Now, again, there are projects out there, there are materials, but we have looked at it and our conclusion is it's very expensive to do this. And I didn't think that, uh, you know, it was cost justified in, in the, certainly in this application where we had a, a pretty restricted budget. Yeah, that commercial new construction is more of the infrastructure is, is going to be there as a prerequisite to, to get closer to that. And then it can make a ton of sense from an energy efficiency standpoint. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's harder it to squeeze does. into a house. Essentially, what radiant cooling does in a nutshell is it moves the sensible or most of the sensible portion of the cooling load from air side delivery to water side delivery. And why is that an advantage? because water can move heat or cooling effect much, much more efficiently than air. Um, you know, we've talked about in heating mode, water uh, having a, uh, an ability of about 3,500 times better than air uh, on a volume basis as far as conveying heat. And, and cooling is essentially the <laughs> removal of heat. So uh, a water side cooling distribution system takes advantage of much lower input wattage per ton of cooling capacity as compared to what a blower in an all air system would require. We got a lot of questions related to glycol. So did you say there was a 30% glycol mix in, in this project? Yep, it's a 30% a um, inhibited propylene glycol. So what are some ways that the design would change if you just said, I don't want to do glycol. I don't want to do glycol at all. Well, um, the, the, 
it's a good question too. Um, <clears throat> again, you, an air to water heat pump, a monoblock system, you, you have the same fluid uh, generally, the same fluid that goes through your heat emitters goes out to the heat pump. And, you know, if it was an all water system, everything is great up until you have a prolonged power outage at sub freezing outdoor conditions. That's where obviously water, you know, that's not moving and it's under freezing temperatures could freeze and burst something inside the heat pump. So most manufacturers of air to water heat pumps uh, at least in North America, are mandating the use of an antifreeze because they're trying to protect their equipment. And not only in a winter, you know, freeze prevention mode, but also in summer, in cooling, it's possible if it was all water that the refrigerant temperatures in the evaporator could get low enough to potentially start forming ice. So they're looking at using a glycol solution uh, both in the heating mode and the cooling mode. And uh, when you look at their IO manuals and so forth and their warranty requirements, uh, my experience is that most of them mandate the use of antifreeze to protect their equipment. Now, the percentage of glycol could obviously vary if it's if it's going in Fairbanks versus, uh, you know, Milwaukee versus uh, Jacksonville, Florida, but uh, they they do want to have enough antifreeze in the system to prevent the unit from freezing during winter or summer. So let's say there's a two hour power outage or something like that. So if it's all water outside mm -hmm. of the building is obviously gonna be a high freeze potential, but inside of that structure with all that spray foam, and mm -hmm. you know, even if you could just get a couple watts to, to move some water around, even with like a battery backup or something like that, yeah. I'd say that ice forming in the panel radiators is is probably going to be like a 24 hour type thing but uh, well, to do it, that it, i mean yeah, I guess it's it, kind of uh, imagine a day where it's five below zero but you've got a 20 mile per hour wind against your unit yeah uh, that's going to cool things very quickly and most of these heat pumps they do have a control function that when the when the water temperature when they sense the outdoor temperature is below a certain value. And I, I want to say typically around 40 degrees Fahrenheit, even without a call for heating, they may turn on the circulator. And the idea is to, to kind of follow up on your point is to bring heat from inside the building and, and simply circulate it through the uh, unit to prevent freezing. And again, that, that's going to help. It's going to stave off potential freezing up until the point where you have a power outage and that circulator isn't running. Uh, if you have a uninterruptible power supply, that would buy you time. But once the battery runs out, you know, you're done. So if you, if you look at, th there's lots of things you could potentially do to trickle a small amount of heat through the outdoor unit and stave off freezing as long as everything's working, as long as your controls are working correctly, as long as, you know, if you're, Counting on batteries, um, obviously there's, you know, can the, can the battery last for two days if you had a, a long power outage? Um, ultimately, the only thing that is kind of foolproof is antifreeze. Uh, so that's- and I guess you could, you could split the building with a flat plate heat exchanger. So just a smaller volume of glycol goes out to yeah. the heat you pump. Can, but we, actually, we did that actually in our office and, and it works, but, the, the downside to doing that, the, besides the you know the cost, you have two circulators now that have to operate whenever the heat pumps on, you know, on both sides of the heat exchanger. The downside is whenever you put a heat exchanger between a source of heat and where the load is, there has to be a temperature differential across the heat exchanger to drive heat through it at whatever the required rate is. And ultimately, what that does is it forces the heat pump to operate at higher fluid temperatures, which takes its COP and its heating capacity down. So yes, uh, you could isolate the heat pump from the building with, you know, with a generously sized heat exchanger. It does work, but it does increase the water temperature requirement of the heat pump. And that, that does work against you. I, I can't give you exact numbers, but um, seasonally it, it probably takes if I were making a guess, it probably takes uh, between 0.3 and 0.5 off your seasonal COP. 
So, you know, instead of a seasonal COP of maybe 2.7, you might see a 2.2, you know? Again, what's the trade-off? It's, it's less antifreeze. Uh, obviously that antifreeze does add cost to the system, but you also have the performance penalty, which means you're gonna you know, spend more in terms of operating costs on the heat pump. Yeah, good point. So I think we're at the, the end of our time here. Uh, anybody else on the call from Kalefi have a question they wanna ask to round us out? It looks like a lot of these we'll have to follow up with that are more specific to some of the components that you mentioned throughout the presentation, John. Uh, anybody mm -hmm. else want to add something? It's two thirty. I was going to say, yeah, it's uh, Cody here. Yeah, we had a ton of great questions in here, and some of them were very specific. Uh, I I tried going through as many as I could here, but but uh, yeah, they're I think they're going to require an email from here on out. So uh, so yeah, for those of you that we didn't get answers to your questions, uh, we will definitely get back to you and and make sure that we can help you out the best we can. Sounds good. Well, I'm going to go ahead and close it up here. We'll follow up and we'll see you next month for Coffee with Kalefi with Christoph Lohr to talk about DHW research trends. And thanks again for attending. Thanks, thanks Matt.